All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Tipples Brews and Wines virtual wine tasting. <coughs> Excuse me. Elizabeth and Jeff Baudre, the owners of Tipples Brews and Wines in Gainesville, Florida. And this week, we're going to an area of the world we've never been to before with our tastings in, what are we talking about? Almost a year and a half now. So um, yeah. this week, we are going to Austria. So, <coughs> and of course, I swallowed funny right as we started. You okay? Um, yeah. <coughs> Sorry, everybody. All right. You need me to Heinrich you? Yeah. <laughs> Nice. I've been nice. living with you that too was, long. That was quality. <laughs> yeah, I thought you'd like that. I yeah. like that. Yes. The Heinrich Maneuver. <laughs> <laughs> so this week we are going to be enjoying the Weingut Heinrich Blau Frankisch from, um, from Bergenland, Austria. It's a lot of really fun words to say. <laughs> it really is. A uh, beautiful lakeside growing region. Um, so let's start with let's, if you haven't already done so let's take a look at this beauty um pop open your bottle of wine and pour yourself a glass um did anyone was anyone else surprised when you popped off the capsule and glass enclosure right extremely surprised because i i use a little um foil you know whatever and did this and I looked at it and I was like, oh my God, there's no cork because the angle I was looking at, it looked like I was just looking at dark glass. I was like, uh oh. Uh, and then I was like, oh wait, never mind. <laughs> uh, it's all got through, through me. So I um actually about a well a week ago, a week ago yesterday. I was drinking an Austrian wine uh, with a wine rep in the store. And same thing, he, um, he, he went to Corv in it because, you know, wine reps are going to go show this wine at five, 10, 15 locations. And he usually, he said, well, this will teach me because they say you should take the foil off before you use the Corvin. Um, you guys know what the Corvin is? No, you should explain what the Corvin is. All right, Corvin so is. the Corvin is a way to, it's basically, it's not a hypodermic needle, but it's a needle that pierces the cork and then it pushes a little bit of the inert gas in there and then it forces the wine up through the needle so that you can serve wine without ever opening the bottle and it'll still be, stay good for two to three months. Um, which so is a really clever system. It's perfect for reps. <laughs> it's perfect yeah. for wine reps. They they want to they can use it for days in a row, mm -hmm. and the wine is still showing like it's never been opened. Mm -hmm. So, but he was taking a shortcut and not taking the foil off because it, it's a thin foil. It's like how, how dull is it going to make my my needle? Right. Well, when underneath the foil is a glass enclosure. Kishproink, um So it destroyed the Corvin? Destroyed the needle. Ooh. Now, not the whole Corvin. The okay. needles are replaceable because they okay. do dull over time. However, that was an instant. It looked like something from Dr. Seuss. It was really kind of funny. <laughs> I felt badly. Yeah, but, poor guy. But yeah. now he knows. Now he knows. Glass. You know what? Austrians love that glass enclosure. It's not just for rosé. So we've talked about different corks before. Mm -hmm. Any reason why they chose glass? It's nice. It's cool. Yeah, it's okay. cool. It's pretty. So um, there's no, I mean, there's no advantage or disadvantage. No, to it. no, there's okay. no advantage. Either way you go with it, it'll be fine. So. Okay. All right. So um, yeah, I I don't know anything one way or the other that I've ever read that said glass enclosures was better were better or worse. I'm surprised to put. I mean, usually I thought they were utilized for the beauty. Mm -hmm. You know, which rose. But this one's covered up. But you cover so. it. Yeah. Once you cover it up in. Uh, um, you know, foil. In, the, in the foil, mm -hmm. then anyway, there you go. <laughs> but fun story. All right. So um, if you haven't, uh, so we poured this wine. I gave it a light chill. I threw it in the refrigerator for about 30 minutes just to get it down to European cellar temperatures mm -hmm. around 55 to 60 degrees for red serving wine. And you gave it a hard pour. I did give it a hard pour to mm -hmm. try and aerate it because we um, we didn't get to open it. I would like to have given it you know, 20, 30 minutes. Um, it doesn't need a ton of time, mm -hmm. but a little breath is always good. And this guy's got a lot of acidity, which we'll find out later on. So it's always good to give it a, a breath. Uh, let's go to the first slide. We'll talk about pairings. Okay. This one was kind of fun. 
because it was nothing. I, I didn't feel like I was being redundant or repeating what I'd done with the mm -hmm. other Reds recently at mm -hmm. all. No, not at all. Wine ratings on this guy, Wine Enthusiast 90. Uh, we're talking about something that is a very unusual wine by American drinking standards. So I wanted to do something that, you know, had some good acceptance. I'm, I understand we don't, we don't put all of our faith in ratings, but at the same time, it's really good to see something that should be a good representation of the style. Uh, food pairings, schnitzel, red cabbage, borscht, bratwurst, and spetzel. So how about that? Yeah. Here we go. I hope you guys are all eating schnitzel or spetzel tonight. So. No, I had um, sausage earlier today. There you go. Yeah. And, and but work. of course, like with most wine tastings, we're <laughs> yeah, foodless. <right>. Foodless. <laughs> That's all right. It's a busy world. So, um. A really, really spicy wine. Let's uh, go ahead and jump back to us, if you okay. wish. So this is 100% Blaufrankisch. Blaufrankisch is the grape. Okay. I was uh, wondering if that was the region. Or... Right in the good, good thought, mm -hmm. right? Right. The, mm -hmm. the region is Burgenland. Okay. So Burgenland within Austria, the grape is Blaufrankisch. Um, alcohol content uh, on the lighter side, a little bit for, um, for reds, 12.5%. Mm -hmm. Oh, that is okay. on the light side for us. Uh, we cover age worthiness regularly. Um, this guy's a medium again, uh, kind of like last week, five to 10 years. Um, I wouldn't go beyond that. We're talking about medium to low alcohol levels, um, medium tannins and a higher acidity. The acidity helps, everything else is modest. So it can, it can evolve in a positive way in you know in the bottle but not, you don't want to hang this guy out for 20 years it's, it's not up for that yeah. mm. really nice and spicy mm -hmm. peppery on the nose i haven't even gotten to the palate yet oh you've just been smelling it mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. i've been drinking it that would be why my glass is much lower than mm. yours is now with a lot of my research they talked about how modest the tannins can be mm -hmm. But then other ones kept jumping back and forth and saying, oh, but Blaufrankisch is the higher tannic wine, which allows for better aging from Austria. Honestly, between the two, and it seemed to go back and forth and back and forth. And, and I honestly believe this guy's got medium high tannin, not medium low, which that seemed to be the, the argument. And I think it must just be, it must just depend on how they're growing. Now this has a very specific combination of growing climates. This is actually, it's all Blaufrankisch. It's all one estate, okay. but two different growing areas that they bring it together. And I think I can see why, because this guy could definitely age longer. That's some really, really nice tannin on there. And I mean, to me that would elevate it from, yes, you could do a chicken sausage, but you could really do a nice full pork sausage, okay. beef sausage mm -hmm. with this guy, with what I'm tasting peppery spicy yeah deep rich fruit mm -hmm. and really nice grip on that tannin so it's a single varietal mm -hmm. you just mentioned i know that like traditionally old world doesn't do that but do germany and austria do that yes okay yeah um that is much more of a french thing okay i'm excellent unless you're in burgundy so really french and italian or just french Mostly, I mean, the Italians do some blending, okay. you know, with, most, with their things, but mostly. it's a very much a dominant thing. So okay. you'll have, um, uh, which we'll, we'll drink through some Tuscany and some Chianti. And those are, um, they're not only Sangiovese. They mm -hmm. have a few blending grapes, but it's by far the dominant grape would be Sangiovese. Um, so really it's more um, Bordeaux had that whole thing about blend the grapes right, to get the right. best out of all of okay. them. But then again, you've got the Burgundians in France mm -hmm. and then say, nope, Pinot Noir is the best in the world. There's no other red grape needed. <laughs> yeah, so, but uh, anyway, so, and we go, actually, I really, really like this, mm -hmm. this wine. I think, yeah. you know, to, to, to reach out into an area and I would have covered it no matter where we went on, landed on this wine. I would have said, hey, look, but let's, let's cover Blaufrankisch in Austria. I mean, we should, we should know, right? Mm -hmm. let's, let's explore this. To me, and we'll see what you guys think later on, I think this is a delicious wine and very, very easy to pair with what Americans would like to pair red wine with. Because this is hearty enough to go with the lean steak. 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. He said, what Americans would like to pair a red wine with? I'm like, so everything? Because that's what I'd like to pair a red wine <laughs> with, like literally everything, even though it's not what you recommend. Right. Jeff always kind of looks at my choice of food with my red wine and just kind of sighs and dies a little bit inside. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> A grouper and a Napa cab. Yeah. Delightful. <laughs> <laughs> Julie's right there yeah. with her. Yeah. <laughs> you know what would be really good with this petite Syrah? Flounder. <laughs> I love red. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, it pairs well with a grilled cheese or spaghetti. It's fine. Peanut <laughs> butter and jelly sandwich. It's all good. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Oh, you guys kill me a little bit inside. That's right. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about, we've got medium high acidity, mm -hmm. definitely, right? Almost Italian in styling yeah. and that acid content. Bone dry. Mm -hmm. um, definitely not any sweetness left over no. in this guy. Um, Although I can taste fruit. I mean, I can taste the fruit mm -hmm. in it, but it's not sweet. Mm. Really nice fruit but it is dry fruit mm -hmm. red and it's famous for red fruits so red plums raspberries strawberries i think i could run across that whole gambit and say i can find some of each yeah um red cherry i can go there as well it is a red kind of flavored wine yeah despite that really intense coloring mm -hmm. i would go very red on the fruit yeah what about the body how would you describe that mm. Medium, okay. medium to medium plus, probably oh, medium. Okay, because I was going like medium minus. Yeah, I'd, I'd say medium. Okay. Yeah, not medium plus. I'll take okay. it back. All right. I withdraw my statement. Medium. <laughs> I'd say full on just medium. You're right. Okay. It's not a heavy bodied wine. Yeah. But the intense coloring and everything mm -hmm. is, is, there's a lot of intensity here. A lot of herbs, a lot of spices going on in this guy. There is real complexity in here, which I think is a lot of fun. You're talking about ugh, the pairing options are almost endless. I get the herbs more in the nose mm. than the taste. But what about spices and pepperiness? On well, I get taste? pepperiness, definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like venison would be amazing with this oh, as well. Oh, be fantastic. Right. Mm -hmm. And the tannins, which like I said, they kind of, the descriptions I was reading with their, you know, with going in, there's like, oh, it's modestly tannic, it's highly tannic. That's why it's age worthy. The most age worthy, mm -hmm. this one is of the Austrian reds. Okay. Um, I totally get that. So yeah, this guy can hang out for, you know, I think 10 years. You know, I, I went from, okay, let's see, maybe five. So it's got another five years on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm glad, this bottle. Mm -hmm. I'm very glad that this is the 16 vintage mm -hmm. because I would not have wanted this younger. Okay, it'd um, be too uptight. It would be really wound up and we I, I don't think we would be getting as much as we are now because there's a lot. This is not just a linear wine. I've been talking a long time before we're even going into the first slide, mm -hmm. just pulling apart all of what I'm experiencing on this. That doesn't happen with a really young wine. Okay. It would just be much more like, oh, it's really tannic, maybe some pepper, highly acidic cranberry. Okay. You know, that would be kind of, I think, where it started sure. before it began to change with age. All right. So before we go into the presentation, okay. um, thoughts from you guys. Uh, what have you, what you've been experiencing? Are you liking the wine? Um, do you agree with what I'm tasting? Have, have what I said, uh, has what I said, uh, you know, lined up with what you were experiencing? What are your thoughts? Well, the tannins really hit me when I first opened it. Mine's been open for a little over half an hour. Mm -hmm. And so it's calmed down a little bit, but wow, it was just like, what else is going on here? But the tannins and the dryness mm -hmm. kind of hit me right in the face. Yeah, it's... It's, it's a great, very robust wine. I mean, if I were, um, it to me, it drinks closer to Italian in styling mm -hmm. than German in styling. And there you have Austria over there, you know, right. just north of Italy and, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, east of, of Germany. And I would have assumed, I was thinking I was going to experience something before I had it the first time, mm -hmm. more like a German, like maybe 
maybe a fruitier version of a German produced Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. This is not that. This is a very different wine, much more of a powerhouse. And then if you look at the chat, Rachel okay. said um, she likes the way the tannins present. It's not in the back of the mouth. It stays forward. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Sure. Yep. Yep. I can see it. And mm -hmm. that's the thing. It's like if you had something, you had a sausage or something that, that had a fatty content to it, it's going to keep cleaning your palate okay. and then allow you to keep tasting it fresh and get a fresh pairing on there. Yeah, I, um, I, I totally agree with your red fruit comment because like right before you said that i was like i turned to her and i was like this this tastes like a kind of like raspberry cherry like it tastes like one of those sort of like gummy fruits that you get that's like red but you're not really clear on what flavor it's supposed to be <laughs> it's just red flavor and you're like yeah all right. mm -hmm. um but in, in the in the best way possible that's exactly what it tastes like where i'm just like yeah it's yeah. not i like it <laughs> yeah, I, I will say that I felt like when I first smelled it, it smelled, I was excited because I love cherries. So mm -hmm. I smelled a lot of cherry and, but when I tasted it, I definitely tasted that red fruit component, but it wasn't, like you said, it wasn't sweet. So it was kind of like thrown a little bit, but it's, it's definitely good and I enjoy it. So it didn't taste as fruity as I thought it would when I initially smelled it, if that makes sense. I get that spicer, um, peppery, like other factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, herb, herbs are really coming through for me. Like the yeah, peppery, herby, it's, it's good. Yeah, I like it. But uh, yeah, the herbs are really coming through. Right, yeah, there's some, it's, it's kind of a, a sage and uh, you know, an herby blend. Mm -hmm. that's uh that's going on there brambly herbly you know kind of herbly herbly it's it's herbly <laughs> like you're going through the spice cabinet you're right, open kind of right. finding what you need and you kind of get that sensation yeah mm -hmm. yeah kind of yeah. like a almost it, it's not quite italian spice you know italian right. blend but right. there's the basil-y kind of effect mm -hmm. yeah it's it's great i, I think it's a great wine mm -hmm. wonderful complexity on there Let's uh, jump in to see where it's from, what it is, why it is. All right. So the Blau Frankish grape, uh, the origin is Central Europe. It's, it's pretty much where this comes from. Um, the uh, other names for it, uh, Lemberger uh, and Limburger uh, in Germany and Kef Frankos in Hungary. So to the east and west, they're still growing it mm -hmm. under different names, okay. um, and it is it, it's from this area. So it is um, it is a an indigenous grape to the area. Um, basically, wh why would you leave it as indigenous when you could come up with another word, right? <laughs> so the wine classification for a grape like this is. Autochthonous. Autochthonous. Instead of indigenous. Yes, autochthonous. So, first to a grape varietals that are almost exclusively the result of natural crossbreeding in that area. Mm. And they are really well suited to that area. And so that's where they work really well. And hence, indigenous, right? Right. Uh, anyway, autochthonous. There you go. Wine word. Boom. There we go. Um, are you sure that's how you pronounce it? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a, no. Yeah, it's got to be a tough for us. Maybe. Yeah. Right. We'll go with that. That's right. Uh, I know we're talking about it's the most age worthy of the, it's considered the most age worthy and kind of the most character driven of the red grapes grown in Austria. Okay. But it's not the dominant one. Oh. The Zweigelt is the dominant red grape in that area but it's just a big fruity casual wine mm -hmm. it's a fruity red that's wine. why it's dominant because it's just like yeah it's like hey, like hey. table wine it's table wine mm -hmm. yeah it's it you know so you can make a bunch of it i would assume that's probably one of those things that's going to begin transitioning over time because austria like most places is making more and more good wine they're okay. finding the market for it mm -hmm. the you know and so i would assume that you'll probably get to where maybe zweigelt is more of a blending grape Okay. Maybe since it doesn't have, 
it doesn't have the character it doesn't have the tannins mm. it, the big thing is lack of tannins uh from what i was reading about it okay it's just a nice pleasant fruity wine okay. a little bit like um, nothing special like uh beaujolais or almost beaujolais nouveau so uh you know it's very you know from gamay grape mm -hmm. just there can be really cool gamays mm -hmm. but there can be really just fruity okay you know, okay as well so um the if this if these are the red grapes what's the white grape jeff mm -hmm. that's the question coming right <laughs> I actually wasn't going to ask about the white. I thought we were just going to stay in the, the whole red. No, you put me on the realm. spot once. You put me on the spot forever. I'm okay. going to make sure. I'm okay. never forgetting it. Okay. Anyway, Gruner Veltliner. So a lot of you heard of Gruner. Um, Gruner, once again, runs across that entire area, <laughs> east to west. But Austria is Germany, best known Austria, for it. Mm -hmm. okay. But Gruner is best known in Austria. It's, the, it's a great summertime white. I mean, it's just... A porch pounding crusher. It's hot out. So we have to try that sometime. Yes, we will. We will get there. I think we should. We'll, we'll drink some Gruner. It's delicious. It's good. Well, right, right now, well, it's like you know, one hundred and six outside. Right. Yeah. Well, right now it's a little better. Well, right this moment, yes, because of all the rain, but sure. the summer. Mm. Should I go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. All right. Primary flavors: blackberry, bramble. Okay, blackberry, not a red. We talked about raspberries and cherries. Um, honestly, I would, uh, you know, like I'm not saying I'm- You would disagree with that one? Look, I can go with one of those tart blackberries, mm -hmm. but I would definitely go regular cherry over black cherry. Okay. Them. I'm not getting any dark chocolate. And then like like raspberry see. over blackberry too? Or cranberry? Um, I, yeah, I, I would. I, mm -hmm. Raspberry, cranberry let's say for this grape, right? right. Like maybe in a, a different producer, maybe mm -hmm. a different thing. This guy is a really good version of this grape, but it's not the only version. Right. So, um, chocolate, not getting so much right now, mm -hmm. maybe a bit, but I would go more, more graphite than I would go chocolate if I'm looking for something really earthy and minerally to pull out of this. Oh, hold mm -hmm. on, we have a chat. Mm -hmm. So no allspice, no blackberry, no dark chocolate. Yes, pepper. Yes, cherry. Yes, cherry. From Chris and Robin. Right. Yeah. It's interesting. So mm -hmm. these are these would be kind of traditional things to look for. It. Mm. I think, but a lot of these things are adjacent to what we're what we're tasting. Yeah. So um, yeah, I, I would go, definitely go allspice. But we're getting a lot of herbs out of this guy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but this is once again, this is a blend of a couple of regions. A riper region in a less ripe region, and okay. that may be why we're getting something with a little more. Going Same on. grape, but a blend of regions. Yeah. Okay, hold on. We have a couple of other chats. Okay. Yep. Agree with Rachel um, and Linda. Right. Yep. So agreement. Right. Yep. So um, dry, definitely. It's it's a dry wine, medium bodied, medium high tannins, medium high acidity. Going good with all that. Thirteen and a half to fifteen percent. Interesting. We're a little lower on this guy. So this guy, I think this one is a little tighter. And if you go tighter, a little bit less ripe, mm -hmm. you're going to get a little lower alcohol. You're going to get more red than dark fruit. Oh, okay. So makes that sense. all makes sense. Mm -hmm. And that is by design with this winemaker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so before we go on to the next one, Harriet, pepper, cherry, and how do you say that? Cassis. Cassis. Mm -hmm. um, all right. For her, or maybe Jerry wrote that. Um, because he's the, no, okay. Mm -hmm. He's the only one we see at the computer. So, <laughs> um, and then it looks like Linda and Paul have a question. Yeah, that's what the QQ is. Quick question. Uh, so the, the, the flavors that we're not getting, is that something that would come out as the uh, wine matured? Possibly. So it's a good question. Uh, it could be as the wine matures, but it's more likely that this one is grown with a little bit more and and actually because i know where it was grown so i can say that speak to this a little, little more um Confidently. confidence but um it's a little bit more that it's included some cooler growth grapes in here so they're not as ripe and if you were to take this and you can see almost where it would go if it had more of the warm growth overripe version of it probably does get into that black cherry blackberry and maybe some chocolatey flavors rather than what we're seeing, we're tasting tonight is a lot of red and maybe some graphite and a ton of herbs. So I don't think, but if you get those other flavors, you're going to get 
many fewer tannins ah. because the riper you get, you're going to overwhelm those tannins and, and you make them softer. So, so it's a choice, yeah. definitely, that they that the winemaker made. Uh, like Harriet's letting you know why she's not on camera because she's insane. Right Austin. there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like for me to go to the next slide? Yes. Okay. I like that they they, they don't like the term taste adjacent. Yes. It's that, a it's that, a new uh, Jeffism. A, I was just gonna say hmm? a new Jeffism. Oh, thanks. I would, with, I would this, revisit this, by that. the way. I would definitely revisit this in intent to. All right, so here we have a grape where we have kind of a, remember I was just talking about this last week, right? So we have kind of a, a medium grape, right? Mm -hmm. So we have, it's got great intensity to the skin, but not overly thick. Okay. So medium thickness, and it has a really nice acidity, but it's not overly acidic. So it's got, you know, kind of a nice spread of characteristics throughout the entire thing. So on that skin and in that area, you're getting a, obviously a lot of color. It's an intensely black gray, which we saw in the slide. Right. You know, in, uh, in there. Lots of color, lots of flavor, um, not overly thick. So, um, you know, medium to medium high level of tannin. Um, but no slouching, you know, no slouch in the acidity department either. No, it's definitely so um, it's got a lot of freshness, mm -hmm. which is what is turning all these fruits red for us. You know, lower acidity, the more ripeness, the more warmth, you're going to reduce the acidity. Mm -hmm. You're going to darken how much the, the, your oh, experience okay. of, the, of the fruit, right. right? So with the greater acidity, which we'll see why that is in this wine. So more tart, your experience is going to be more of red fruits. Red fruits because it brightens it. And right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So here we are. And we are running way over to, let me get this right here. Do, 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 in this area. So about so three the, quarters mm -hmm. of the way up, about here is where we're going to be. Maybe seven eighths. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> so right pretty, in the, in the pretty, growing area, but in the growing area, but yeah, pretty, pretty in the high. Yeah, in yeah. the top half. You're right, and it is a cool <clears throat> growing area. I mm -hmm. mean, this we'll we'll see the evidence okay. of that as I look at some. We look at some of the pictures. So here we go. So we have been drinking through here, through here, through here, all the way down to here. Um, where is Greece? Here's Greece over here. I can move the chat box and stuff that's in front of it for you if you want. Well, I, can, okay. I think we can all agree Greece is here. Okay. <laughs> and then here we are tonight. So there's the Austria, uh, the Austrian, yeah, uh, the Austrian growing region. Uh, by the way, these are the Germanic ones. So you see how they run along in these valleys and everything. Mm -hmm. They're not just spread around like down here. Look at this. You're like here. Right. You have a warm, dry area. Here you have a cold area. <laughs> we have certain very specific regions that sure. we can grow these grapes in. Uh, they have a pretty broad area. They get a lot more warmth over here. Though their version of warm is, probably, we'll, we'll see. We'll probably not it. what we consider warm. By the way, I love this graphic I found today. Mm -hmm. I think it's gorgeous. Um, and I give credit for it at the end. So here we go. You can minimize that. So moving into Austria, so it's all like we should, we were able to see it's all in the eastern end of, of Austria. Um, and we're in Bergenland, right around the lake, which is, let me find my, my version because I can't read this very well here. Lake Neusiedl. <laughs> yeah, Lake, lake Neusiedl is my okay. best effort. God bless Austrians. Um, I'm working on it. But uh, so there's Hungary right over the border here. Yeah. Slovenia is down here. They're making a lot of good wine down there now. Okay. Um, a lot of the Italians are going over the border because between here, you've got Slovenia and well, here's Italy right there. So right. you can see it all runs together there. Oh, I didn't realize Austria bordered so many countries. Oh, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So what we're talking about is this area, like we're not down here tonight. We are up here wrapping around the lake. And the mountains are actually on this side, on the east, on the western side. So we'll take a little closer look. So Goals, this is the location of the winery in Goals. Um, this is actually kind of a plateau area. This is the warmer growth side. 
And then they actually source from both sides of the lake. And so over here where you get into the mountains a little bit and you have a much cooler growth, higher acid, that's how they balance the two. Okay. So I think if you were to do all this side or down here, mm -hmm. you're going to get a lot of that, that richer version that we were talking about. I really like this version because I love the extra grip and the freshness. Mm -hmm. And that acid is going to help with meat too. I mean, you want you don't want just tannins when you're dealing with red meats. You want mm -hmm. some of that acid to work with the fat as well. Okay. Like um, with the, why? What does that do? It well, it plays with it in a couple of ways, right? First of all, it helps liberate it off your palate to give you a fresh bite. But beyond that, remember that that TV show is like acid, fat, salt. Mm -hmm. Those are all the like the the different the different areas you want to hit when you're making meals. Okay. So it helps to add some, some of that. So. The, um, the soil here. So here we are in uh, Bergenland. Um, it is, the soil is schist with limestone. Yeah, it's, it doesn't look like there's any soil. There. Yeah, right. <laughs> it just looks like all like rocks. It's, it's or... broken up rocks with limestone yeah. down below. <laughs> it looks like the worst place in the world to grow anything mm -hmm. other than like destroyed hopes. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, I mean, that's a really big, thick old vine there, it looks like. It is. Mm -hmm. Well, and here's the thing. The schist on there, those rocks mm -hmm. will absorb the heat of the sun. They do get a lot of sun. Okay. It's a cool area but they get a lot of sun and they hold the heat in during the night. So to help the, um, to help protect the, the, you know, the vineyards. So that protects the roots. Protects the roots. Yeah. And it's going to radiate heat up. Oh, okay. Yeah, know, that makes sense. Upward as well, under the canopy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which we see, they have more of a canopy effect here. Right. And that would be one of the reasons they do that because it, the, the warmth radiates up and it helps ripening. Okay. All right, so Weingut Heinrich, um, which means, so the Weingut, which mm -hmm. I was like, wait a minute, doesn't that mean good wine, which by the way is the reason for the password this week, wine is good? So they say Weingut, not Weingut? It's Weingut, okay. I'm sure it's Weingut. Right. Um, that is actually what they put in front of wineries that are estate, estate produced wineries. Oh, okay. So Weingut means winemaker, it indicates the wine is grown, made, and bottled on the premises. Okay. And so it's so they're all not, a state. They're not buying from other people. Right, exactly. I don't remember the term. For Negotiant uh, right. in France. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and these guys are biodynamic, <laughs> organic, uh, sustainable, the whole thing. You see them here with, you know, the wonderful sheep that it graze along to get rid of the weeds and everything. Uh, in between the uh, in between the grapevines, and they don't eat the grapevines, huh? Nope, that's cool. Mm. So uh, this guy is basically a natural wine. Um, natural wine is a big term right now, right? It's mm -hmm. it's a big hot term, and there's no exact definition. It's kind of like sustainable. Uh, mm -hmm. I was laughing with a wine rep today, um, and we were talking about sustainable. And sustainable, some people say, oh, well, um, you know, we're sustainable because we reuse, uh, we collect rainwater and we have solar panels. And another guy says, well, we have, we're sustainable because we work with our local communities and we build school, school houses for the children. Hmm. Well, is, yeah, okay, it's, it's all over the place, right. all there's good. no definition I mean, for it. Right, there's mm -hmm. no, and there's no definition for natural wine. Mm -hmm. But the general consensus is, it means something where usually organic, <laughs> sustainable, biodynamic, and you do as little as possible to manipulate the wine. What you should be tasting is what the earth is providing in that area. Okay. So more than anything, it should give you a taste of that area. Um, they should be using the natively occurring yeast. So they're not inoculating with a special yeast. They're using the yeast that's there and not adding any chemicals, preferably during growing and really no chemicals in manipulation post pick, right? And that's what these guys do. So this does qualify as a natural wine. They don't put it out there as such. Mm -hmm. um, Why? Since there is no definition, couldn't you just say? You could. I'd have to look to see how much. Some people really, really hang their hat on how much sulfur is added for um, pres preservation of the wine. Mm -hmm. And I don't know because I didn't get that information. Okay. How much sulfur they have it added to the wine. Mm -hmm. Because... Look, sulfur is a natural sulfites, you know, they're like, oh, that's what give you headaches and blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. But 
there's a certain amount that is present in the wine no matter what, okay. right? Um, the Italians add very little to none. Most likely these guys are doing the same thing, but I could not find specifics on what they were doing. But they, everything I saw added up to what could be considered a natural wine. Okay. And that is more common in the old world. You sure. know, people talk about, well, why are so many of them organic so easily? Like these guys since 2006 mm -hmm. have been sustainable, organic, biodynamic. Um, they were already doing it. Okay. That's how they were growing grapes anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're just like, hey, um, give me the certification, please. Boom, done. You know, right. and that's why so many of them over there are like that. Well, and we've talked about before, too, that they just don't have all the pests that we do here. Good point. So they're not fighting it the way we, if if we grew wine grapes would be in Florida. Oh, in Florida? Please. Which I mean, well, yeah. And I'm, I'm assuming in California doesn't really have all the pests either. So, I mean, in our wine growing region, maybe Missouri does though. I don't know. So I don't know. I intend to find out. <laughs> you keep threatening that. That's right. <laughs> all right. So, um, so here we have, so here is the winery. So here's the, the lake, right? And so they source from the eastern side here, and then the western side as it goes up into the foothills and such here. And that gives them very different ripening mm -hmm. and very different characteristics. So here you're gonna have a lot more acidity um, and potentially more tannins, um, Because, but here's the fun thing. So on this side, they have a lot more sun, a lot more warmth, but a lot more wind. Okay. You're going to have thicker skins. Right. So you can get a lot more tannin from here. Mm -hmm. So on this side, you don't have the wind, but you have the coolness because every evening the cool temperatures drop down mm -hmm. and make it suddenly get a lot chillier, which also thickens skins. So you get it from different reasons. Right. And you get this wine, right? Out of the two. Uh, so let's take a look. So here are their vineyards. And there's the lake. Yeah, I mean, they're not far at all. No. Uh, in the fall, mm -hmm. harvesting. You can see the grapes. Yeah. Uh -huh. So they hand harvest. They do. Everything is hand harvested and hand tended during the year with these guys. And winter. It gets <laughs> cold. It's Austria. I, you know, I, I'm going to find a fall version of every place, every we go place that just like, and this is what it looks like. So we could move there. And then right. really it's like the other picture, right. and like nine like, months oh. out of the year. And that's when I leave him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a very modern facility. I mean, look at oh, know, this, guy. Yeah. This, this, this cool steel monolith that's coming out of the grapevines. It's very cool. See that? It's very modern. I wouldn't have expected it to look like that at all. Right, yeah, it's really cool. No, the, I mean, this looks like more what I would have expect out like in California, you know? Right. Like I mean, in, in the new world, really. Yeah, you know? I can see that. To me, it just It looks like a tech firm. It kind of looks like, um, do you like my vine, Mr. Bond? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> actually it kind of does look like that. <laughs> It reminds me, did anybody watch Lost back in the day? Yes. Yes. It's not like the bunker like that they discover in the woods. And I was like, oh, I want to go in and like discover the secrets. <laughs> yes, right. for sure. <laughs> All right. So let's, um, I'm going to stop share for a second. Okay. So we, we've talked all about how we got to have this wine. Um, any final thoughts before I go into the wine ratings and that whole discussion? Any questions that I didn't get to while I was going through it? This is a great opportunity for me to drink more, so. Myra, you can go ahead and take the mic. So you mentioned that when you were talking about how they were kind of saying like natural wines or that's not the right word you use, but clean wine. Now my brain's, not, my brain's tired, but you said some put chemicals in wine, what type? Yeah, you can elaborate on okay, that. Okay, yeah. So there's right. different <laughs> manipulations that people can do with the when, when they're making. <laughs> wine. All right, there you go. So when when making wine, there can be all kinds of manipulation done. There is um, 
there's some people that will buy very, very ripe grapes or even grow overly ripe grapes and there's no acidity. So they will add citric acid to it, right? That would immediately eliminate it from being a natural wine okay. because it's, that wasn't naturally occurring, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are some that add colorants to it. There are some that will add, you know, all kinds of things to it, uh, uh, berry flavors, uh, any of that thing. Okay, you know, what would be acceptable for a good wine though? Like, because obviously there are things that you're talking about that are not good wines, so. Right, that's yeah. true. But honestly, there are some very expensive domestically produced wines mm -hmm. that are extremely manipulated. No, no, no. Yeah. I, I want your opinion of what you would consider a good wine, what would be acceptable to you that they would add? Okay. Um, not you, not because people are buying it because they're still buying it from the name from the 1970s. Okay, okay. Not that. So I would prefer not to have it manipulated with at, the, all. at all. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I mean, I, I, want, to, I want to taste what you've grown, mm -hmm. you know. Um, now I don't mind different levels of oak, right? So I don't mind with winemakers that want to do, maybe if they want to use a more aggressive oak, mm -hmm. a younger oak, and so they want a lot more vanilla in their wine. So that's adding flavor, but it's not like infusing a chemical. Right, right. exactly. Mm -hmm. But I think overall, you should not be having to throw in, and, and this would be mostly crappy wines, you shouldn't be, have to be throwing in um, acid, Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have to be throwing in extra sugar, which they do. You shouldn't be having to throw in extra color. Sugar is just to raise the ABV? Right. They'll, they'll throw sugar in to raise the ABV. Mm -hmm. They get underripe grapes and they, mm -hmm. well, well, I want to hit 15.5. So okay. we're going to throw, throw in uh, sugar. So, And then they'll throw in acid because then it tastes like sugar. You know? If we're talking about wines that you actually consider good wines, mm -hmm. aren't all of them natural then? Like what's the... It, it what depends. Would make it not what, what would like some people throw in more sulfites to mm -hmm. for so for example, let's say you get done with a really amazing Napa Cab, right? And then you finish it off with a good spritz of sulfur in order to give it time in the bottle because you know this thing needs to go 10, 15 years before it's going to okay. see its best, right? Mm -hmm. Then that would kind of eliminate it from being a natural wine because you've added that the sulfites to it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, one of the complaints by a lot of people with natural wines is that they won't last and they're not wrong. Okay. So but uh, this one, I mean, you're saying it's five, 10, 10 years, 10 years. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty good amount of time. It's not 50 years. And, and the thing is, I wouldn't say, I would not agree that adding sulfites mm -hmm. eliminates it from being a natural wine. Okay. I wouldn't agree, you think that's but there okay? are, there are real hardliners that will totally disagree with okay. me on that, on that, you know, especially because they say, look, one of the things we're trying to avoid is the headache from the sulfur. Right. And, and, but organic is one of the most basic principles of like, mm -hmm. if you're going to have a natural wine, it needs to start organic. Okay. Right. Yeah. And then um, Myra said, how would we know that's happening? Like, is this on the label? 100% it's not going no, to be on the label no, would be my no, guess. No, unfortunately. They're not going to tell you when they're adding there, things. There are no it. requirements to mm -hmm. that at all, which is one of my complaints. I think they should have to. Yeah, I think they should have to. I also wish that they would do like some kind of sticker or something or symbol on it that denoted whether it was an ageable wine so that somebody who was just looking at a bottle would be like, oh, okay, so this is one I should age or not. Oh, right. So they don't have to ask every time. I think it's hard. I think I think it's hard for most people to ask, hey, can I age this wine? Because they don't want to look stupid. Like they should know, which is not their job. It's so they not should their job know. to know. Right. You yeah. should know. Right. Exactly. That's <laughs> that's why our store exists. Yeah. Right. But you're right. Most of the places that people are used to going to are not mm -hmm. our store. Right. And yeah. um, that's the thing you walk into a liquor store and there's some wine there and you say, hey, is this ageable? They have no clue. Right. You know, they, they haven't invested in the personnel that can answer that that question. Mm -hmm. It's shame, um, but you're right. It trains people to think I can't ask or yeah. I have to figure this out on my own or which is my opinion, most people just throw their hands up in the air and say, I don't want to be embarrassed. I've got my own life to live and I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to go with a name I know. And I've just grabbed mm -hmm. something I know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Rachel and David said, that's why we need Jeff. That's why I keep him around too. Yeah, so, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> well, I, I'd like to hope 
that I keep it friendly and I and show my excitement, mm -hmm. which I'm I'm excited to share. You know, like, you know, I've done this. I I love learning about these things yeah. and I love sharing. And it's never me like, oh, why would you not know this? You shouldn't know this. You have you're doing your own thing. Right. This is my job. Like I'm here for you. No, I was thinking that earlier, like as I was getting ready, because people that know that I own tipples, like I'm supposed to go to Orlando next week for um, pre-planning mm. and people will ask me wine questions and I'm like, wait, let me text Jeff. I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get to drink all day at my job. <laughs> so uh, gosh. yeah, <laughs> just because I'm like Jeff adjacent doesn't mean I know the wine stuff. So, so there's no, um, there's Os osmosis is only water. No, no, no that's it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, shall we go talk about uh, ratings? Do you want to do you want to share the screen? The yeah, let's screen? go ahead. Let's, let's cover it. Okay. I know everyone here has seen it, but let's just let's play it by you, the book. You, you want a guide. Play it by the book, right? Your rating. You can go ahead and type in the chat box. In theory, somebody might pull this up on YouTube and watch it and they've never seen it before. And we'd be like, holy cow. Uh, anyway, so let's look at these guys. All right. So um, 80 to 84, a good solid wine. This guy was rated 90 points. That is not an unusual rating for this uh, for this wine. So that was at the you know at the entry level of outstanding a wine with superior character character and style. 85 to 89, a very good wine, well made with special qualities. None of these are bad ratings. Mm -hmm. um, I love to say it, and I'll say it every single time. People that will say, I only drink 90 and above, that's just not going to, you know, that it makes little sense. Yeah. I mean, if you, if an 86 point wine lines up with what you're in the mood for that night, it's going to taste amazing. Yeah. Or if it lines up with your price point. Exactly. I it, mean, honestly, it's a great wine still. So there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. So let's see. We've got, it looks like we have an average of 90s because we have yeah. 90s from Lyndon Paul. Brian, 93, Julie, oh, nice. 90, um, Solid, 90 for Harriet, Rachel, David, 90 oh. and 89, 90 from Chris, mm. 89, 89, 91 right, so from right John, 90. and Brenda, and then, okay, yeah, oh, oh, oh. So <laughs> Chris Rowan thought it's an 81, yeah, mm. so 89, 90 from Consuelo, 90, 90 is good from mm. Jerry, yeah, oh, Myra said 81. Okay. Not her game, huh? Evidently not. Yeah. Good solid wine. She's like, yeah, it's a red. That's okay. Okay. Uh, but it has tannins. Myra just hates the tannins too. Well, there, <laughs> there is that. It is not a velvety one. It's a little prickly, mm -hmm. you know, a little rough edged on mm -hmm. those tannins, um, which may change in the next five years. But so uh, what's that, Rachel? It's got some tart. It's got yeah. a little bit of tart. It yep. definitely does. Yeah. It's, um, Rachel, it's, but it's also it's, a unique kind of red. It has behaviors that make it both food friendly and drinkable on its own. Absolutely. Mm. Um, really good food. Okay. Myra thinks hers wasn't chilled enough. Oh. Mm -hmm. That could be. And the thing is really food pairings, because I'm in my mind matching it over. Mm -hmm. And I'm really glad you seem to like it as much as mm -hmm. you do, though. We haven't asked, I haven't asked you your thoughts. No, yet. I mean, I would have given it a 90. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, because I, I, you know, I like a heavier bodied red, like right. my preference is, but this is, I mean, I like the tartness. I like that it would easily go with all kinds of like sausages or leaner steaks. Cause I like leaner steaks. I don't like right. big, big fatty steaks. So right. yeah. no, this yeah. would be, I think with food, you would really, it would take it to the next level. This is a great food wine. How is it with burritos? Cause that's what we're eating tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. Well, we're all about. I guess I'll find out. We're all about the pairings here. <laughs> uh, I agree. Literally, when Brian was like, "I'm giving it a 93," and I was like, and I was like, "Put me down for a 90," and he's like, "A 90," and I was like, "I love it, but it's not as like full bodied as I like." And that's so that's exactly yeah. how you described that's, it. Like, yeah. right? Yeah. I think Harriet's saying yes too. Mm -hmm. But there's, yep, that's me too, Julie. Yeah. You know, it's it's an interesting thing where it kind of converges on. Mm -hmm. Merlot with Barbera, you know, where it's, it's got exactly a little floral. What I was thinking. 
I know. Loathed I'm sorry. For bear, exactly. Because there's so much, there's this spicy thing going on. There's a floral thing going on. Yeah. There's a red plum thing going mm -hmm. on. It's, uh, and then grab in like a cool growth Syrah. It's this really intriguing wine and mm -hmm. it makes me happy. And I really want to have it with food because it would make me even happier. It's a great, um, I love it that it's got a lot to say. It's got a lot going on. I think it all works well together and I want to eat food with it. That just adds up to like an old world beauty. Sure. I mean, I like it standalone too. Mm. I really like it by itself too. Mm. But um, I just want to catch up with the chat. Okay. Good food wine, also good after food wine. Mm. Nice to chill and drink. Less of an aperitif than a digestif. A meatloaf friendly, Jerry says. Oh, yeah. oh Chris and Robin did brats, totally fries, and onions. Yeah. Yes. And then uh, Rachel and David just busted into the dark chocolate. Yeah, yeah. Nice. There you go. Yeah. So good. Oh, I'm glad you guys liked it. I like it a lot too. I would give it at least a 90. Um, with my old world slant lately, You're like I made very it very excited about it though. So it's, I'm, it's a cool wine. I've, yeah. you know, I've never had anything exactly like it. Mm -hmm. It all works and it's all delicious. And I love the intrigue of it. You know, the novelty, mm -hmm. I guess, for mm -hmm. me. Harriet had crabby cheese fries with it. Mm -hmm. there you go. Well, that mm -hmm. would be the definition of versatility then yeah and then Myra's yeah. having crab cakes so maybe that's why she doesn't like it as much too yeah. <laughs> yeah it could not be playing as well with the crab cakes right but it, I, I I hope at the very least and that was my hope mm -hmm. moving into Austria then we can all say well that was really cool and delicious mm -hmm. I'm totally glad I went there yeah no yeah, I, like, I'm glad because we hadn't been there at all yet Right, and I think mm -hmm. we've gotten that and beyond. I think I think some people will revisit this. I <laughs> I would revisit this. I That's revisit my this. phrase, right? Yeah. Oh, um, Myra had it with salmon cakes. Maybe maybe you should you we should have some white too, Myra. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she had sausage with it to start. From there we time. go. Okay. Yeah, that's a better pairing. All right. The, yeah, I think it's a really cool wine. I really Absolutely. like it. Absolutely. Yeah. Should we, oh wait, one more, one more chat and then we'll, more. oh, Harry, I will definitely revisit All right. this one. Yeah, I, awesome. I want this, I'm going to make this with, um, you're going to make so that. I'm, I'm going to drink this. We, we will be drinking this with filet mignon. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. And I fantastic. think that would be really, work really well. Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, Boston butt, John Dickerson, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I don't see him there, but yeah. Oh, he's there. That's right. Oh, there he is. This would be really good Hi, with John. Boston butt, John. <laughs> <laughs> all right let's jump back over okay jump back or go to the next you don't want to reveal yet oh no i'm, I'm ready to go to the next one i'm sorry go to the next one yeah. okay oh we have another thing. all right i want to thank all my sources tonight wine folly as always they are amazing 750.com wikipedia austrianwine.com vinmaps.com one of my favorite new maps of oh, that's Western the one European. With the topography on yeah. It. Mm -hmm. Wine grapes. Oh my gosh, that stuff's so good. Um, and then the wine society. So super helpful. Thank you very much. So their own is their own vineyard the Austrian wine.com or um no, and then the Heinrich winery. Okay. But the, yeah, that would be I use them as well. But <laughs> you know what? But and the uh, wine good Heinrich, Heinrich, thank you guys, because great wine. Mm -hmm. And thank you for all the information. And uh, okay, so next week. Next week, we are going from Austria to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> white wine. It's time for white wine again. So uh, one out of every four. We're going to drink a Sauvignon Blanc Semillon blend. So uh, we from Voyager Estate. We've not had semi yeah. yet. So that is from Bordeaux in France. Okay. And this is a traditional Bordeaux white, right? Okay. So they blend Sauvignon Blanc and, and semi regularly. There's actually a dessert wine that's 100% semi as well, mm -hmm. which we can get into Bordeaux again a little bit more. But this is from the far western side of Australia, Margaret River. And um, you don't have to tell everything right no, now. Just, well, just remember, we have slides next week, too. Okay. Okay. I'm just it's from Australia. It's from Australia. So anyway, food pairings, roasted chicken or duck, 
seafood in a cream sauce because it's got a combination of nice tartness but heaviness okay. and light curry dishes that's one of my favorite pairings with that yeah yeah it'd be really good like volcanic sushi right they've got the lobster with the curry sauce right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah or the duck yeah. with the curry sauce oh that's right which mm -hmm. would work beautifully mm -hmm. or the duck with the basil mm -hmm. they could all work i hope you guys are joining us it's a delicious wine uh really great winemaker we'll talk about it next week along with a different wine that we have in the store from them we and can talk about that yeah, we'll talk about that after we're done mm -hmm. all right so we'll we'll jump into Linda's comment after we're done recording. In the meantime, let's have a toast to Austria. Thank you for joining us. And uh, and I'm glad you guys really enjoyed the wine. I I really liked it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm excited that you guys liked it too. Hope to see you guys next week. We'll Cheers. See you next week. Slancha. <laughs>